We are now at uh, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, of course, and uh, it's interesting to look at how you work with preventing and alleviating human suffering. Uh, you have a global presence around the world and you work in the core areas, of course, of humanitarian values, disaster response, preparedness for disasters, health and community care. And what we think, maybe we are biased, but coming from livelihood, job creation, microfinance, is that that fits right into all these aspects. It's not that you have job creation and livelihoods here, and then you have humanitarian values, health, education. No, they are intimately linked. And this thing, working with livelihoods and job creation, straight on leads to higher uh, degree of empowerment, people wanting to sell their children to school, not having them in child labor, people being able to afford handling their roofs, buying medicine. So all of these things are integrated. So uh, we promote entrepreneurship among the world's poor. 50% of the women we work with, it's mostly women, live on less than $1 a day. A third, further 30 live on less than $2 a day. We feel that growing local businesses and trade increases resilience of vulnerable communities. I think you have all seen that. When there is no trade, there is no business, these communities can fall through. There is nothing that holds them up more than, than the spirit. Uh, and in just six years we have promoted over half a million micro-enterprises around the world. And we work with a very different approach. We work, we are in a joke, we work like a business. We measure results, we go for high scale, and we go for low cost, and we measure impact of what we do in a sophisticated way. We also have a very strong base of entrepreneurial and corporate donors. We have found that people who have started with two empty hands and made some money in their lives, they love what we are doing because they can say, I'm this woman. The journey that she's going to make, that's my life journey. Whereas people who have inherited a lot of money, all the fancy old families, they don't understand what we're about. So, um, our vision is to alleviate poverty through enterprise promotion, and we work for economic and social empowerment of women and of society by promoting enterprises. And our goal is very ambitious. It's to, on our own and with partners, create 10 million jobs among the poor in this world. Is this enough, 10 million jobs? No, it's nothing. How many jobs are needed? How many jobs are needed in the world right now? Give me a guess this. One billion. Oh, one million jobs? Who said? One billion jobs? One billion. One billion? One billion? Two billion jobs? One? One billion. One billion. Okay, go with me on this short mathematics. There are 3.6 billion living on less than $2 a day in the world today. If you count four dependents per one economically active, you could divide 3.6 billion by four to get the rough estimate of the amount of jobs. And we end up with 900 million jobs, one, one billion. Yeah. So it's one billion better jobs, more productive jobs, more well-paying jobs. It's an enormous amount of jobs that need to be created. Who are going to fix these jobs for the poor today? Is it Coca-Cola? <laughs> no, but you're laughing. I mean, Coca-Cola is very important. But Coca-Cola employs 755 people in Tanzania. So even if they double that, they just have 1,600 people in Tanzania, and there are 23 million people on less than $2 a day. It's nothing. So is it the public sector in these poor countries? Debt-ridden, already owing enormous amount of money? Not likely. So it's not the big corporations. It's not the public sector. Who is it? We get an answer here. That's what we end up with. The poorest people on this earth, the most vulnerable, are the ones who unfortunately have to fix their own jobs. That's the reality. Do we leave them at that and do we just say goodbye, good luck? No, we can do something about them and support them in this. 
but to sit and believe like a lot of governments do in both the developed and the developing world and just wait for uh, the big corporations and come and, and, and help them. It's not going to work that way. So, we are um, a group of, in a bit like the Red Cross, Red Crescent, self-governing organizations that work together, shared by a joint vision, mission, ideas of, of, of strong women running their own businesses. Um, we are, were founded in India by a very dynamic team under Dr. Kalpana Shankar, together with a Western businessman, Dr. Percy Barnwick. And they uh, created a model together of, uh, with innovative ideas, uh, of, of um, creating livelihood and business. And the model has spread to other countries. We are in Afghanistan, we are in South Africa, in Swaziland, Namibia, Kenya, small project in Brazil. And then we have just a couple of few Westerners sitting in London and Sweden. Very, very few. 4,000 people globally and 12 people in London and four in Stockholm. So this is a South, an organization from the South. And in each country we have a self-governing entity with a, a, a board from the local country. So it's not run from the West in a sort of army pattern down. It's a, a, an organization of parallel, equal uh, partners. And in the West, we work with fundraising, we work with partnerships, we work with coordinating the group and strategy for the group. Uh, and these are some of the results uh, that have been achieved so far. You can see that we have uh, and this started off in 2004, and we are now 2011. So seven years, more than 600,000 women. The SHG means self-help group. And the women in India are mobilized in self-help groups. In Africa, we use a lot of common interest groups. These are different terms when you mobilize people into microfinance. And you can see the amount of enterprises created and promoted in the system. It's a phenomenal growth. So you will ask, okay, these enterprises, are they around after half a year? Have they died? What's happening with them? And we had some Stanford students in India, and they saw that after three years, 85% of them were still up and running. It's not 100%, but it's still a very good number compared to enterprises here in Geneva or in Leeds. Because there is always a cycle of enterprises being born and then dying. So, who are the women we help, which is, of course, much more important than the numbers. This is an Afghan, uh, Najiba, an unemployed widow with six children. Her husband were killed uh, by uh, the Taliban's. And uh, we trained her. Um, she took a loan of $100. She bought a clay oven, and we trained her to use the oven in a hygienic way. And then we train her in how to sell her bread, reach the markets, and get a good margin on the bread that she's selling. So creating this oven running thing into a business that she could live on and support her family. Yeah, she's worth an applaud. Yes, she is. Shall we take? Uh, here is another lady. Uh, from um, uh, Rustenburg, which is, um, you know, this small province of South Africa where they have the platinum mines. This lady's husband went away and worked in the mines in South Africa and didn't come back. So she was also left with six children and uh, she had her smallest child couldn't buy, she couldn't buy medicine for him. She had two children who were child laborers and who were hanging around. And she has started a brick-making business together with five other women, producing bricks, selling bricks to local building sites, um, and has savings now, and the whole family can eat three meals per day, and all her children go to school. So in a small microcosmos, you can see how this starting the business leads to an income, leads to a sense of empowerment, I can do things differently, leads to I buy medicine, leads to I make sure my children go to school. So it's like a <coughs> cascade of positive empowerment that happens out of the enterprise creation. And what's so interesting with this type of aid 
is that it's a one-off. You don't have to come back next time and give her new food. When you give her the fishing rod and in a developed way tell her how to use it, she gets going on her own. And I will tell you soon how the fishing rod works. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so you see here, we have women doing all sorts of things. They are doing, what type of businesses do they do? They do all sorts of production, so it's a lot of agriculture, of course, because people in the developing world are uh, in agriculture. But it's also other types of, of production. Uh, this lady here is doing organic manure, which is a very good type of business, because, uh, of course, the raw material here is for free. It's cow dung, and they, if you have cows, you have that already. And then she can sell the organic compost um, to uh, middle classes for small trading gardens. It's a very successful business. And we have a lot of different types of um, garment industries. We have a lot of service industries. We have beauticians. We have caterers, uh, people who sell street food. And then we have all sorts of trade, buying and selling. And all these different businesses, you have to take the women through the specific skills they need to do this properly. Yeah, I talked about the power of an enterprise and how the jobs change lives. You can eat. Okay. She's so quick, this woman here. <laughs> you can eat better, you educate your children, you can buy medicine, you can repair your home. Jobs change life. It's actually, it's like in the West. If people didn't have jobs, we would have endless suffering. Society would have to help us with everything. Countries would have to go, go bankrupt. And here is what we talked about, the different sectors and how they want to contribute. And we all concluded that it's going to be small local businesses that are going to be ultimately the solution. And this has been very little talked about in the debate. Do you know how much of the general, if you look, there's 120 billion US dollars every year going to aid. If we agree that small local businesses is a very important aspect of that, how much of that 120 billion is actually going to helping poor people set up businesses? Give me a percentage. 20%? Two percentages? Right, it is two percentages. But if we agree that this is a cornerstone in fighting global poverty, why is it two percent? It doesn't have to be 50 percent, but it could maybe be 10. 15. And I think this mindset is starting to change right now. I'm now drawing a cube, and it's going to make you all think of your mathematics lessons in school, which might make some people shudder <laughs> and others be happy. This is a cube. Does anyone remember if we got? the different sides here. Does anyone remember how you calculate the volume of a cube? Oh. <laughs> Can I get? A times B times C. Now the interesting thing is that the volume of entrepreneurship in a given society is also dependent by three things, just like a cube. And if any of them is zero, what happens to the volume of the cube, if any, is zero? It's zero. So it's the same. So if instead of A, we write financial capital, and instead of B, can you see? We write knowledge capital. And instead of C, we write social capital as in what's inside a human being in terms of beliefs and values and empowerment. That is the formula for entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley, in Geneva, and in, you know, among poor peasants anywhere in the world. It's the same. You need to know what you are going to do. You need to have the specific skills, both about your business and about the market, about the production, how you are going to do it to create products that are high quality enough. You need to understand your market, how you reach your customer, how you talk to them, how you price your products, how you deal with competitors. If you don't have that, you're smoked. You can't do it. 
you need to have the financial capital, you need to be able to buy uh, your raw materials and so forth and be able to invest in your business. If you don't have that, you're smoked. And if you don't have self-belief, if you don't have motivation, if you don't have the inner guts to get, go for it, you're also, it won't happen. All of these things are necessary. And this is how we do it. So here you've got four goals, but it's basically the three things. You have the finance, that's the financial capital. You have the empowerment, that is the social capital. And then you have the knowledge capital, it's just that we have divided it here into two segments. It's the actual business training, it's training in entrepreneurship and the actual product. And it's training in how to reach and develop your market. This is how Hand in Hand is different from a lot of microfinance institutions because they only focus on the finance aspect. And now we get into what you talked about. The problem with just being a bank for the poor and just providing credit is that you are not building an income side. You are just making them take loans. And if you haven't built a business, you are just taking the loan for consumption. So how do you pay back the loan? How do you pay back the loan when you haven't had an income? You can't pay it back. Either you can't pay it back or someone else. borrow from someone else. And what, where's the only place they can go borrow? From another microfinance bank. And then when they want to pay back that, they go to another microfinance bank. So in some markets where we come, people have four or five microfinance institutions by their clients. This is like an endless game ending in suicides, despair. It can end nowhere. And we have been warning against this development for a very long time. About, it's almost like a bubble. It's like the housing bubble in the US that ended in the, in the world financial crisis. When you have a lot of very poor clients who are building up loan volumes and who are not building up assets, you are going to get the bubble and you are going to have problems. That's why it's so important to help the poor to use the loan for investing in an enterprise because then they will have income to pay back the loan. So you're creating, in business terms, you are creating a balance sheet for them. You are creating an income side and a cost side. If you just have the loans, you're just creating a cost side. So that is why we are such strong believers in ensuring that the women really use the loans to facilitate enterprise creation. Can you all follow me in this? Because this is very important. Does anyone disagree? Up with their hands. Um, how do we make sure that the women use it for business creation? Do we, do we put the spy in their home? No, but we make sure they start a business. We know that they are starting a business. We register that and we guide them in that process and we talk to them about why it is important that the money is utilized for business creation. And then we do a third thing. There are a couple of different ways of organizing microfinance groups. You talk about self-help groups, you talk about joint liability groups, common interest groups, rotating groups. And what you do here, we have taken the old self-help group savings-driven model of India. These are technical terms in the microfinance world where people save a small amount of money and combine that with the joint liability model of the Grameen Bank model. We are not the Grameen Bank, but where people are jointly, collectively responsible for a loan. So our women start by saving. So there is a small capital that is rotating in the group that they have saved. And that money, they can take as a loan and use for whatever they like. So there they can have the roof, or they can buy the medicine, and the beauty of that is that they haven't borrowed it with the bank. They've borrowed it with each other. So it doesn't create the liability with the bank. If something should go wrong, it stays with the women and doesn't create these debt cycles. So that's another mechanism. So we have about 90% of the loans that are taken with hand in hand are used to actually set up an enterprise. And with other micro, some microfinance institutions, that figure can be 10 to 30%. Very low. What are the rest of the loans? Consumption, medicine, housing, and uh, what's it called when you get marriage? Uh, <laughs> dowry. Dowry, sorry, I forgot the English word. Dowry, jewelry, religious holidays, all of these things which might be very important 
to the poor people, but it's so much better to have them invest in the business and then start paying for these things out of the income generated. So, uh, I was thinking I should give you a very quick course in microfinance, a few minutes. Do you want to have that? Yeah. Very quick. Who can see the, this now? <coughs> idea of, not in super detail, but just an idea so that you, when you hear microfinance, you can say, yeah, I actually know how this works. How many, how many feel today that, yeah, I know very well how microfinance works? One person. So you can correct me if I make mistakes, okay? Let's say this is how we do it with the, the type of model, but it will be a similar type of process. But this is the savings-driven approach. Um, we have a group to facilitate of 10 women and they decide in the group that we are going to save $1 each per month. They decide on that sum. Let's say $1 each, that's about 50 rupees in India or something similar. So, how much do they have after one month? 10 women times $1, how much is that? $10. Very good. After, after two months, they will have how much? 20, yeah, exactly, $20. And after three months, they will have $30. And after four months, the group will have $40. We don't have a single loan that's gone out yet, but what has gone out is a lot of training. In entrepreneurship, in enterprise creation, first in group formation, in the saving methodology, and so forth. Because when the groups come, they can be very, very raw. A lot of them are sick when they come to us. We have a lot of old widows, they have no teeth. People are very traumatized when they come. So just getting the group together, this is a good way of getting going and creating social capital in the group too. Now the good thing with this $40 that you have after four months is that that is a base for a credit evaluation. Let's say that you go uh, to the bank today and want to get a loan, your credits will be, your credit rating will be evaluated on how much money you're making and what assets you have. And the women, we are helping, what incomes do they have? Nothing, almost, less than a dollar a day. And what assets do they have? Nothing, or a goat and maybe a dilapidated house. So this is a way to create a credit rating for these women who have nothing. Because you do something based on the credit record they have had in this group, have they come to the meetings, have they been saving regularly, and look, here is now a sum of money. And that is a way of getting down the interest from the bank, because it takes down the risk of the bank. So it's a very clever pro-poor approach of getting interest down for this group, because it now becomes something in the eyes of the banks. And then they can get a credit rating, let's say that they get one between one, two, four. One is the lowest, they haven't been coming to the meetings and they've been a bit sloppy with the saving, so they can only borrow one times 40, that's $40, and four is the star group, and that's 40 times four, that's 160. So they can, the first loan goes up, it's between 40 and $160, it's actually $100, which is a usual sum. And then, who decides who's going to get this loan? Because the group takes the loan, but then one person will get it. Who decides that? Do we send in some high fancy Wall Street banker doing assessments of business plans? No. It's the group. They are good to do this. They will do it because then they are jointly liable for the loan. So they are the credit committee. Illiterate women, a credit committee? Yes, it works. The repayment ratios of most, in most microfinance entities is 95% plus. It's better than any, any regular lending activity in any bank, and that's also why so much money has flooded into the microfinance sectors. $15 billion, 2008, flooded into the microfinance sector. Now, that was both grants and also equity investment. So, very simple, this is microfinance, and then the loans start coming out to the groups. 
Now, there are different models here. I talked about this being the self-help group model, uh, which is a very common one, these joint liability groups models, group models where you have um, the group taking the loan. In some countries, like Latin America, you will have individuals taking the loans, but that's usually in more commercially developed markets. Question? Yeah, um, I'm from Nicaragua, mm -hmm. and so in Adelaide. But uh, microfinancing is a big word. When you go back home, because growing up, what I've realized is, and I figure it's the same for all the other developing countries, in that within the community, groups of individuals, as poor as they are, they'll do the same thing. And at the end of the week, at the end of the month, or whatever, someone gets to loan that amount of money. And uh, we, don't, we didn't call it microfinancing, but in all contexts we call it the SOB, S-U-B, which is the same, pretty based on the same principles. I think other, other developing countries would have something similar in Africa or wherever. And um, so I just wanted to bring that up, that this same principle has been in, in effect probably hundreds of years within developing countries. Yes. I think that's a very good aspect and I think that is exactly why microfinance has grown out of the South and the developing world because there has been, of course, many ideas of how to provide capital to people who don't have any capital. Uh, so there have been the saving kettles of South of India, microfinance, you talked about the source, etc. Anybody else want to share a similar type of thought? Yeah. We do have the same system in Pakistan. Pakistan, yeah. And uh, uh, it's, it's like that, it's like a saving, not, they don't have to return the, back, return the money back. It's everybody is in the group, almost 10, 20 women together, they pay every monthly, and from that 20, 10, 20 deposit, one person will get it. So every month there is a draw and somebody is going to get the money. Yeah. And they are not going to uh, pay back that. So it's a, just a saving for everyone. So it's a kind of microfinance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is, it, all these are saving mechanisms. So what we have done is take these old saving mechanisms and put on the turbo of enterprise creation support, so to say. Okay, how do we train the women? Why is it pictures? They cannot read, of course. So we use old tales, we use mythology. The one to the left, you've got two donkeys who are going different ways. No one can eat. But when they put their heads together, both can eat. So try to create win-win with your customers. Try to create solutions where you both can eat. This is very interesting. This, I think, is my favorite training session, or one of the favorite training sessions. Uh, very often when we come out to the women, they will say, I can't do anything here. Nothing is sold here. We're very, very poor. And then we'll ask, is nothing really sold here? Why don't you next week bring along something that you bought last week in the village? So we put out, in the middle, you have everything that's being bought on a regular basis. It's food stuff mostly, it's beans, it's rice, it's garlic. This is in India, so it's a lot of chili, of course. <laughs> Very hot, hot and spicy. And then we have things that are being sold on a weekly basis. So it's toothpaste, shampoo, a few other stuff. And then a circumference on the village, everything that grows in the village. What is now this? This is a snapshot of the village economy. This is the trade flow of the village. This is everything you can sell in the village. Because everything has been bought, you can also sell it. So this gives for an illiterate woman a very good way of starting to think creatively about what she could do in this village. Carrots. Do I have a small yard behind my house where I could grow carrots? Tomatoes. Could I cultivate those? Could I even, by cultivating and taking away the third of the tomatoes that are of bad quality, double the price on the tomatoes that I have left? Could I start processing the tomatoes? Could I make tomato ketchup, tomato soup, 
and then increase the price even further. And who comes here with a toothpaste? Could I do that instead? Could I go somewhere and get a contract so that I come and sell this? And what's being cultivated around the village? Could I grow any of these crops? So this is a way of starting helping the women who have very little education start thinking about what could I actually do? How could I participate? Because one of the things we do is that we never force anyone to do anything. Everyone chooses which business they want to do, but you've got to give them knowledge and you've got to show these are opportunities, these are alternatives. So do you get any thoughts when you see this? No thoughts? It's very good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's very good. And you see, it's done with very little means. It's done on the floor with a, just a, a chalk on the floor. And then we, of course, train them in finance and numeracy. And since most of the women, or a lot of them, are illiterate, we also have to train them just basic counting plus and minus and percentage and so forth. And in the groups, it's usually one woman who will run the book, who will keep the book. Um, so the women sort of look after themselves in terms of borrowing and lending. And then we have the empowerment, we have confidence building. And that is, of course, very tricky matter. How do you do that? This is from Afghanistan. A lot of these women are in desperate situation. Husbands have been killed. War is going on outside their window. How can you build confidence in that? Um, and I can just say that our staff are doing fantastic work with using all the latest tricks in the psychology book. They are. Uh, I've seen groups where they have just been very, very new. They take away half the group and they say, okay, now you are going to imagine that you are three years down the road, your business is up and running, you are successful, you are confident, and then you are going to sit in the middle of the group and have a board meeting. And they don't tell the other ones around what's, what's happening inside, so they go and sit and have their meeting as if they were down the road. And the people around them say, oh, they look so confident, they look so happy, they look so relaxed, they are on the way, what's happened to them? It's just because we gave them this image, you can do something with your life. And this is, of course, extremely important for a business person, because, you know, when you are a semi-starving person, you have a life horizon of maybe three to four months. Sometimes not even that. But when you invest in a business, you have to have a life horizon of a year, two years, three years. And this is exactly what top sports people do. They see ambition themselves succeeding. But you can do that with poor business women too. And uh, we work with the groups, of course, and they are an enormous asset for us because very often our women have been confined to homes and they have been exposed to husbands and sometimes mothers-in-law who have been a bit rough with them. Very often uh, they have been subjected to uh, domestic abuse. I remember coming to Swaziland once and meeting one group, a new reform group, and a third of the women were domestically abused. I have never, they, were, they had stopped being ashamed of it. They were in the streets with it because it was so common. But this group was openly discussing, one was sitting with a broken arm, one was sitting with a blue eye, one was sitting with a swollen face. I mean, it was, but they were sitting and discussing I cannot do anything about it on my own, but we as a group can now go and talk to the individual husbands. That this cannot go on. And this will hinder, if you don't believe in your wife's dignity, you can believe in your wife's ability to make a livelihood for your family. And she's not going to be able to do that if she has a broken arm. This has to stop now. It's very forceful to see. And when we go out in the self groups and we ask the women, is there anyone meeting in the group? Yes, and they don't say anything to us, but it's stopping now. They work at it as a group. It becomes a very strong platform for the woman to enter into society. And then, of course, the financial capital. We have 98% payback in 10 months, and as I said, this has, of course, created a lot of interest that microfinance is attracting 
such good repayment ratios. And this also, to tie back to your question, attracted a lot of Wall Street investors who went in and invested in Indian microfinance banks. There was a, a bank called SKS up in Andhra Pradesh, which raised almost 400 million US dollars and became the first listed microfinance bank in India. And most of these investors came from America and were hoping for you know, a 30-40% return on their investment, which of course created a huge burden on the poor. And what we are thinking, I mean, I'm just thinking aloud now, and I'm not talking for the hand-in-hand -hand family, but one thought is that maybe down the road you have to create a two-tiered microfinance world. One is a professional banking service that operates like banks and where you've got the big sharks coming in and maybe targets like lower middle class. And one is players like us, NGOs, that are pro-poor and have as an ultimate objective not to get our money back, but to help people grow. And that's fine. Poor people need these credits, but, but everybody knows what is not. You should not be able to go in and have 40% return on investment and say you are doing something for the poor, because it doesn't work that way. So, uh, I've talked a little bit about the specifics, and we are taking this further. You know, 70% of all the people living on less than a dollar a day in this world are working in agriculture. So increasing productivity in agriculture is an extremely important step to alleviating poverty. And there is another aspect of, of it too. Uh, today in the world you have a lot of migration going from rural communities into the bigger cities. And where do people, have, where do people end up when they come into the cities, when they... they slums. And what happens to their lives in the slums? They lose everything. They don't find a job and they lose the little social capital they had. So helping them continue living where they used to live in rural communities is very, very important. And we work with increasing productivity. So this is a, a case we did for the Dutch Developmental Bank, FMO, where 4,000 women were trained in vegetable and fruit cultivation and 4,000 women in dairy. And where we worked with procurement, how to... Uh, um, pick out stuff that wasn't working well and sell at a higher cost. How to process, how to um, make pizzas, make all these kind of goods, create food stores so that you could sell the stuff you did at a higher price. How you could package your stuff, brand it. Um, some people were cooking Vaseline, so you know, what could you add to that? thing that they have been doing for 50 years in terms of maybe some fragrances, how could you put it in a nice jar, how could you brand that jar, and at what market could you uh, sell that, and how you market it. And this uh, created 8,000 sustainable micro-enterprises at a much higher value than before. And these things can be done, even with semi-literate people. It's not rocket science. So let me just, because I'm, I'm running out of time, uh, say that it's very important to understand, because when you come and do a quick, uh, you know, giving people food, you come and give them that for the day and it works over the day, we are working with processes. And I mean, it's self-evident, you will understand that. And it's a journey from taking the women into groups, from training them in business, from the microcredit, from the advanced training into their businesses. And this arrow represents the size of the business, but you know more importantly what it also represents. It represents the growing confidence of the woman, how she grows into becoming something in her own eyes and in the eyes of society. And it also represents the income of the family and the status of the family. So there are so endless amount, an avalanche of good coming out of this enterprise creation. And um, I should also add to you that in this world now of uh, microfinance, there is a lot happening. And if you are interested, you should go out, read on the website. There are, uh, the World Bank has been enormously helpful in this. They've created a lot of sort of um, um, support structure, you could say, for the microfinance world. You've got the SIGA which is sort of an analysis a consultancy. You've got Mixed Markets that has an excellent website for microfinance institutions where you could go out and look. There was a third one you wanted. 
the Microfinance Gateway, which is also an excellent source for looking at microfinance related stuff if you are interested in these things. And let me finish off then by saying that we said that about 900 million new jobs need to be created to get away from the less than two dollars a day. If we take the one dollar a day, it's about 250 million jobs if we take the same mathematics for dependence per economically active. So it's one billion divided by four, that's 250 million people. Our estimate that it costs about $200 to create a job, it's a very low cost because it's a one-off. And if you take the 250 million better jobs times $200, what is that? That's about $50 billion that it would cost to seriously start migrating the most suffering people out of poverty. If you would spread that over 10 years, that's $5 billion a year, that's about 4% of global aid today. So we're not talking about hugely changing everything around, changing the deck around. This can be done in our time with the means we are already allocating if we start thinking about poverty in a more holistic and sustainable way. Thank you. What I should tell you is that Hand in Hand is starting a Hand in Hand Academy training people in our methodology. We're doing that with a couple of professors from Harvard Business School. So that's how we try to find new models of working, just like the Red Cross has University of Leeds here today. Uh, we have found some very pioneering, and I think there are still some places on this academy if somebody wants to go and, and uh, get trained in how to work with the methodology. Uh, I, should, I should say that. Um, I think your point is very important. I mean, I'm here because we are looking for partnerships and we can't do everything on our own. We are an open platform. We want to share with others what we do. We are not for profit. We don't have anything to preserve. So we're open in wanting to share. We can't ourselves be everywhere. So we would love to work with others who can spread our methodology in our way of working. Uh, but one must remember, though, that this work must be done with quality. So uh, when you enter each country, it takes about a year to adapt the model to the local social and business context. And you have to be spend time doing that. Uh, because we talked about the social capital being extremely important. And when we work in Afghanistan, we have a, a lot of issues there. There we had to bring on board the men because the women wouldn't come. Um, our Indian trainers had to learn the Quran, to be working through the Quran. That was a new uh, context and it has worked out very well in that way. In Africa, um, in Kenya, we have a lot of issues with the tribes, the Luo, the Kikoyu, how do we manage with that? I mean, it's all issues that the Red Cross is also working with. But these have to be woven into the model. Uh, so I think with, with the right partners and them understanding that this is not a quick fix, it takes a year to get this up. Uh, we can do a lot of good. Or want to do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say, um, the old model that um, my colleagues have mentioned, that it has existed in the um, dead world. So it's given a way people contribute money at the end of the month to each other. But I think what the problem has been is that most of that money has been used for consumption rather than investment. Mm -hmm. And what's missing is probably things like some sort of business training, as well as what you've talked about, the social capital, actually changing your mindset. Because if you give money to someone with a poor person's mindset, is I get money to eat, I get money to use on things. But that, that money could actually be used to make something more, or as in, it's, it's seed money rather than food money is something that would really, really be important because I think the principle of saving money where you have different people coming together and contributing money over a period of time and giving it to people, it already exists so we can build on that. But definitely the scale up is going to be important. The business training is very, very important and the change in mindset <coughs> will be very important as well. You sound like an apostle for having yeah. had. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, yeah. Thank you for that presentation, it was very nice. You said a part of the reason why you create sort of partnership, 
Now we know what Red Cross stands for is humanitarian, is health related. Now, um, talking about microfinance and health, how do we now marry the two? How do we merge it together and we need to rescue people in distress? How does the two work together? How can the partnership really function? Uh, I, I think that they are intimately linked. Um, I'm a biologist by training, and one day I would like to do um, a PhD project on our women, because when they come they are sick, but they're not sick after a year. Something happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but this is on an intuitive level, we are, on an empirical level, we are seeing that something is happening. And it's not just that you get money to buy medicine, but it's, you know, sickness is, is a certain diseases, but it's also very related to your stress levels. And the cortisol is very related to your immune system. So I would say they're very intimately linked. Thank you. I've seen some groups get these loans as, as a group from the microfinance, but I've seen several women get loans as individuals. And the problem, and so many of them do face if they cannot pay back the loan, the ruthless manner in which their property is taken out, they're already poor. The little they've gained from this microfinance, maybe boats, a bridge, or something, their little property is taken out in a very ruthless manner. And the self, I have a feeling the self-confidence and esteem that has already been built is broken down because this is a community and people already know this person. And it also makes the other women failed not even to try to join the microfinance trust just because of what happens to another woman. I don't know what you're doing to address this. Well, uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's awful. That's what, um, you know, it, you are right that this is happening now and it has been happening. I think the good eye, the good thing is that the media has started talking about it. Yeah. yeah. We've got a lot of We have many questions, yeah. so let's try to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm from India. Uh, I'm involved in SMG moment. What I learned, two things. I have been two patients that in a SMG there is all, always a one person or one woman who has a power and to dominate generally. So how we manage that thing? The second thing that in your model, if you see the Myrida model of India, which is uh, more on a value-based and how to resolve the problems in the community. I've seen, I mean, I've been there and the women go to uh, uh, the panchayat or the uh, government authority to re uh, uh, resolve their issues from the SHGs. If you incorporate uh, that things into your model, it might be further increase its values. Yeah. Um, so, two questions. One about yeah. So I will give this to Sofia, who has been working with us in India for a very long time and see this. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I, uh, I know very well my Rana. It's a great organization in, in India. And I think Hand in Hand has tried to copy or imitate some of, your, some of the work that you're doing. So our, our work with self-help groups is very much uh, similar to uh, my Rana's, where we work with a lot of um, social empowerment and political empowerment as well and, and encourage the women to come together as a group, not just as a self-help group, but also as a federation, many self-help groups, and approach panchayats and higher up on the political, in the political administration. But also regarding, uh, Mukesh, your question regarding a, a huge society like India transforming in, in a very in a fast pace where, where poor people are, are expected to become entrepreneurs and sustain themselves and at the same time a very neoliberal, harsh capitalist context, global context. Um, in Andhra Pradesh this has become very evident and there has been a, a huge uh, crisis in the microfinance sector because uh, many of the players are extremely commercialized and, and um, I would say ha they, they have nothing to do with working to alleviate poverty. Um, but I think also what's missing in an Indian context, although the government has done a lot to facilitate and create an, an enabling environment for microfinance organizations, 
where they have, for example, devoted, banks have to lend to uh, what's called priority sector, where microfinance is, is uh, and agriculture is priority sector lending. But something has happened with the regulation of microfinance in India, and they're not getting anywhere. So, so far there's no microfinance bill um, or microfinance law where, for example, you could have a cap on interest rates, you could have a more uh, a nationalized bureau to register clients so that clients will not get loans from any institutions. It's, you can regulate and regulate as much as you want, but in India they haven't done that yet. And I'm guessing in a lot of smaller African countries like Swaziland, for example, even if they have a law, implementation will not be there. So I, I definitely think government should, should uh, if this is going to play a role in poverty alleviation, governments have to start playing a bigger role as regulators, not just of uh, the larger organizations, but also of the smaller ones. What we have heard from you, you are more focusing on the women's side. So what you are doing for the gender equity? There is no equality. If we would, men wanted to have a uh, microfinance or wanted to have a loan, whether you promote that or? Yeah. We, we have done that in certain countries. We tried in India and we got a very low repayment ratio. Oh no, about 50%. <laughs> so our, our, on the other hand, in Afghanistan, you know, in the whole world, about 67%, two-thirds of all clients in microfinance are women. So it is a well-known fact that it, established fact that working with women is good, and a third is men. So it's about two-thirds, one-third. Uh, in uh, Kenya, we are going to have some men on board in some groups. I think we have been quite pragmatic around this. We have worked with it in, in the way that, so that it works the best possible way. The second question is that you have, whatever you have discussed, you have talked about very uh, positive impact of the microfinance. Can you share what are the negative things you have learned from that? Maybe the businesses have, has not worked and there are problems they face and how you have taken care of because as Fiona said that these are the problems that when they have, they can't be able to return the money, how they have to, what they, what they should do. So how you take care of that? Uh, I, um, I think I've tried to share with you how microfinance in itself can be very negative if you just have in the cube the F and not the knowledge capital, the social capital. And we've heard stories also how that can ruin people's lives. Uh, I think it, difficulties for us, oh, hole in the floor, is that it's very hard to do these things. You have to have very good people on the ground. You have to train them well. You have to mobilize your staff well, get them all out there. It's like, you know, it's like sending out a whole army. It's super complicated. It takes enormous dedication. We keep our costs very low. We have very low overheads. So we keep salaries low for all the staff. And they travel endlessly on bus and so forth. I think our problems are just, you know, the logistics and the sheer volume. We are operating this on a very large volume and making this happen is a huge challenge for us, but we make it happen, but it's not without strife. Do you kind of provide some institutional support, um, like consultancy services? For instance, in my country, Nigeria, like the central bank, they are scratching their heads now about how to come up with a regulation to re legislation to regulate microfinance. Uh, what happened was that, um, given the experiences in Asia, uh, countries started promoting the idea of microfinance institutions, and strangely, uh, everybody, that uh, anybody that um, in the middle class probably has an MBA, started thinking of setting up a microfinance bank, and there's a proliferation of all sorts of microfinance bank, and they're wondering maybe it's just too much. Do you, pro given your experience, do you provide institutional uh, consultancy service to like central banks on how to regulate um, microfinance institution because we are just having so much of it, and. Yeah, I think that um, you're asking a lot of a seven-year-old organization. I wish we could do that, but um, we 
don't at this time have a consultancy. We're thinking of maybe down the road there could be one as a sort of offspring from the academy. I think the type of advice you are looking for can be provided. I know the IFC is very good, uh, part of the World Bank is very good at providing this kind of institutional guidance and have microfinance experts who advise government central banks uh, when setting up these institutions. When it comes to guidance for individual entrepreneurs who want to set up microfinance <coughs> banks, who want to do this, what's called a transformation going from an NGO into a microfinance institution, I know there is a big knowledge gap in that area and many such people will be coming to our academy in the summer because we have done a similar type of transformation in India. So the institutional support, actors like the World Bank, and when it comes to the, the local actors, it's a much more difficult market getting advice, just as you said. Okay, thank you. Uh, my, my issue is uh, trying to get it right the first time, because I'm from Swaziland, by the way. Uh, uh, someone was looking at me as if I'm beating all the women. <laughs> And uh, I, I'm really concerned about getting it right the first time because uh, we, we don't have to increase women's vulnerabilities first before we can we can actually make them better. Like uh, what I've seen is that uh, when we empower women and forget uh, the context within which uh, they survive, like uh, how their relationship with their husband, then we actually increasing their vulnerabilities and uh, we need to get that right the first time in terms of including uh, maybe their husband and uh, we empower the family as opposed to the wife or the woman because uh, there are issues there like uh, we need to to try and protect one uh, gender try to increase their, their, their safety levels. Uh, like we would want to empower them knowing their HIV status so that we can actually increase their participation within that social group. And if they would introduce that to their husbands, the issue of HIV testing, and they get themselves beaten up black and blue, then we, we don't need to go through that stage we need to get it right the first time and uh, in include everyone who is a key stakeholder with it. That was very wise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, for bringing this perspective. I think from a humanitarian perspective, I think it should be maybe better to talk about grants instead of loans. Um, in the same line as the, the lady in the first row, uh, we shouldn't increase the dependency or the vulnerability, we should empower them. So that give grants, zero, zero interest grants, education, maybe it sounds like utopia, <laughs> but um, I think it's, it's more interesting to talk about grants instead of loans. Uh, I can understand where you come from. But let me add that if you have a very low interest loan that is adapted to the income cycles, it's very good to support these women become functioning members of a market economy. And if you can, through a gentle process, by training them, coaching them, making them ultimately be self-playing pianos in a market economy, you've done them an enormous long-term service. So you might be right, there might be circumstances when things are very, very desperate, I agree with that. But there is also an enormous benefit of this gently normalizing marginalized communities back into regular society.